So welcome to the Carissa Eanes One office hour. So Kevin and Rob will walk you through a lot of information this afternoon. I apologize that I'm gonna to have to step away to another meeting, but I did wanted to take the opportunity to welcome you to this office hour and engaging in conversation with Kevin and Rob. Um, we will record this. So you probably have received the little notice at the top of your screen that this office hour is being recorded. Essentially, that is documentation that we put on our website so that if we should have a question that is repetitive and or an opportunity to say, I wasn't able to attend this office hour, we can point them to a location should they need the information. So welcome, everyone. My name is Shelley Shassi Jandro, and I am the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs, which is the office in which the EANS program sits within. Um, so Please know that we have teammates monitoring the chat box. So if you have a question, go ahead and tuck that right in the chat box. And my apologies for having to exit, uh, but I do know that I'm leaving you in capable hands. So Kevin and Rob, thank you so much. All right, thanks Shelley. All right, uh, my name is Kevin Harrington. I'm the gear and EANS coordinator. And I think Rob would like to say something. Yes, I'm Robert Palmer. Um, everyone refers to me as Rob. I am the capable hands that Shelly was referring to as far as uh, you guys would be interested with me. Um, so uh, I do the EANS procurement and the fiscal end of the EANS. So uh, if you have any questions about invoices uh, or the few participants that we have in ARP EANS, if you have any questions as far as, um, you know, once we get to the fiscal end, I am the person to reach out to. So. Great. Also, we have uh, another team member here. She may want to say hello. Hi, I'm Karen Kuziak. I'm on the Emergency Federal Relief Programs team, uh, but my primary responsibilities are with the funds that are going through the ESSER programs to the public schools. But we do meet regularly with our whole team together. And we, Try to pay attention to what's going on with both sides of our programs. Good, so good afternoon. Okay, we'll get started. And uh, first of all, it is being recorded, as Shelly mentioned, and it'll also be uh, posted to our website when we're done. It takes a little bit of time to get it converted. We'll have the, the live recording, but we'll also have the slide deck there on our EANS website on the DOE uh, webpage. So uh, feel free to... Um, Rob, I'm going to admit these folks as they come in. I'm not sure if you're seeing it, but I'll add them in. Yeah, it's and, popping up. Uh, so I'll try to click it whenever I see it. Okay, thank you. All right, so basically what we wanted to do is uh, go through kind of beginning to end of the Carissa Eanes 1, some of those major requirements that, that come up along the way. And of course, early on, we, we know the intent to apply had to be completed and approved, and then the application completed and approved and so forth. But we're going to assume we've, we've done all that, and all of you folks have. Uh, I know some of you are relatively new, and, uh, and if you have questions along the way, please put them in the chat, or you can always connect with us through our email address or the EANS box. Uh, we also have our phone numbers on, on our emails and so forth, so don't feel like you cannot check with us at any time along the way. So the big piece is the inventory reports or requirements uh, so that this is our topics for the day. Inventory, reimbursement requirements, disposition, you might like that one, uh, staffing requirements, and we have a slew of additional things that we put in there, some of the other end of the a typical grant, uh, some of the audit requirements and whatnot that'll come up. And of course, we'll end with some questions and answers. So we'll get started and then uh, Rob, you are running the slide decks. Okay, so inventory requirements. Some of these things I hope actually are a repeat to you folks. And again, if you knew, then it probably isn't. But there is a requirement under Carissa Eanes 1 and other grants also, but in, in specific uh, particular today, Carissa Eanes 1, the inventory requirements are here. And you probably have seen a slide in one of our other office hours. They are right there in your, if you went to sign into Jim and you went uh, to look at your application and whatnot, under Carissa Eanes 1 and you open it up, you're gonna see a GAN, it's gonna say G-A-N. And if you click on that GAN report, you're going to see at the bottom of the page, a, a few attachments, A to D and a couple of other ideas, uh, op opportunities for you to kind of get up to speed on some of the things that are required. So if you go into that GAN report as part of your application, you'll see this exact slide and uh, 
some good information. So inventory wise, there is a requirement every year to do an inventory of all these items that are out there. And you recall that these are uh, items that are purchased and in, in owned the title, if you will, is the, with the state of Maine. So there is a process to go through. On our website, we've given you, and it's, it's right there as a, a link for you. There's an inventory sheet that we put together that addresses all the things that are required by statute. And you'll see some of the citations and whatnot along the way as we go through this. Many of the schools have, in fact, already done this, and a few still have, haven't have quite gotten it done. So if you haven't, by all means, get it, get it squared away, because that is due. The first one was already due, and the next slide will show you um, some of those due dates. So back here on January 31st, 2022, that would be the first one. Any of those that have come in, I've looked over, and uh, I have them in a file, and we're just simply hanging on to those until the performance period is is over. Now, la the slide just before, you don't have to go back to it, Rob, but the slide just prior gives you some ideas of how to tag this equipment that you may have. And that follows along um, with the requirements. So we're at the very bottom and tag example, uh, the inventory number, Krista Eanes one, it's, you say which grant it is, because you may have others. And then the, the title the title owner is the Maine Department of Education in the state of Maine. So just keep those things in mind. And like I said, some, some of you have already done that, and that's great, and they look decent. And uh, however, you want to remember on that next slide, Rob, there's another one that's coming up. Um, so there will be three of these throughout the period of performance for this grant. And all of that kind of culminates on one of the later slides. I'll talk a little bit about auditing. So I'm all set with that one, Rob. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, reimbursement. So, I mean, this is, again, just a reiteration of information, uh, preparing your invoices, having your supporting documents, um, kind of having an outline. You know, we are looking for a trial balance with dates of purchase, supplier, and the amounts that were spent on the items. Um, and then, you know, if you have, you're going to want to provide the uh, invoices and the receipts. So if you get a purchase order for, let's say you decided to replace your, your textbooks for your math curriculum, you know, provide the purchase order or the receipt that shows how many per, uh, books were purchased, you know, when they were received, et cetera. So that way we know that you actually have those items on hand. And then it would go into the section as far as what Kevin was talking about. As far as having those items tagged as well would be the next step after you receive those items. Um, and we are not able to invoice unless you have received the items. So you want to make sure that anything that you are invoicing for is something that you have on hand at the time. Or uh, let's say for a subscription, it's you're not allowed to invoice until that month has elapsed. So if it's a 12-month subscription you paid for the year, uh, and let's say you started in January, when January elapses, you'd then be able to charge for January uh, the 12, you know, that portion of that uh, subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are some of the big key items. Uh, and then again, the documentation, uh, try to have it in a reflective order based on your trial balance. So if you've got books, uh, books, pencils, and paper are the three items that you're invoicing for. Try to have your supporting documents lined up so that way it's your receipts and POs for your books, then your pencils and your paper in that order, uh, just so it kind of flows because the better it flows, the faster we're able to move through the items uh, rather than jumping around between trial balances and the items because uh, the more items, the more convoluted it can get with uh, the purchase orders and the receipts. Uh, and everything does have to be in PDF format, gems, does not like anything outside of PDF. It throws a temper tantrum. Uh, and I'm sure everybody's had to deal with at least one gems tantrum, temper tantrum so far. So, I mean, we're here to, to help work through those issues. Um, but if we can do things to help smooth out the process, like making sure everything's in a PDF format, it makes our lives a little bit easier, makes your lives a little bit easier, and then we can get the money back to you guys faster. And I'm in charge of the slides, so I guess I need to move on to the next one. <laughs> so again, we're still talking about the reimbursement, just you know, trying to touch base. Uh, you're not able to process a reimbursement unless if you if you started an invoice and you did not finish it, you cannot start another invoice until after that invoice has been submitted and has been approved. 
So that's a key feature. Um, you know, I wish we were able to just stack up the invoices and and have them so that way you guys could just queue them up and then send them out. Uh, unfortunately, the system does not like that. It wants it processed one at a time. So if you're doing an invoice for January, February, March, until that's completed and you've sent it off and we've approved it and sent it off to uh, the accounting side that actually cuts the check, you can't process it. Now, once we've approved it, then at that point in time, you are able to submit another invoice. So that is good to know. Um, and then, you know, we're down below, we're just talking about the expected timelines. Um, we are pretty good about uh, beating that time. As far as uh, once we receive it, it normally does get processed within a few days, uh, but we do try to say 10 business days because if we end up getting a lot of things dropped in our lap all at once or a lot of invoices all at once, it will take time to process. So, you know, please keep in mind that it can take up to 10 days just for our team alone to process the payments um, through the invoices. And then obviously we have other agencies involved as well. So we have their expected timelines, which uh, is roughly about 25 business days for DAFs to cut the check. So once we've approved it, it's about 25 days. And then depending on if you have the electronic method or the mail method, uh, if you go through mail, then it'll take three to 10 more days in theory, uh, depending on the post office. So again, uh, kind of another hand in the, the process of getting a check back to you. All right, and this is an example of uh, what you'd be seeing as far as when you're processing an invoice. So you should see your uh, previous total or your previous invoice totals. And in the red, uh, we're kind of cutting it off a little bit here and there, but you will see uh, budgeted for previous purchased uh, PPE. So that's for anything prior to April 26, 2021. So if you're processing an invoice for anything past April 26th of 2021, it would need to be run as a future expense, which we can see down below in the blue uh, blue highlighted area. And that shows the previous invoice total for the purchase services of uh, future, uh, future purchases of PPE. So if you have any questions regarding that, please feel free to reach out to me. That's It's an easy one for us to walk through. Uh, if, you know, if you need to move money around because you have more in your, you know, more budgeted in your uh, purchase, uh, your previous expenses uh, for the reimbursement, and we're already past that deadline as far as your invoicing goes, just reach out to us. We'll open up your application. You can move that money from your reimbursement to future expense because there's no point in leaving money behind in the past that you can't touch. Uh, so we're more than happy to accommodate you in that way and, uh, and make sure that, you know, you're able to utilize those funds accordingly. All right. I'm back in it. Uh, just one other thing on the reimbursement piece. Some of those uh, slides, uh, you will also find that information in your application, perhaps your intent to apply or the application itself and the various scenes grants. So you will, you'll find some reminders if you get to that point and you're like, what was that date he was talking about? They'll be there in the slides on the webpage, but they're also in your application. So the disposition of Ian's property, this has been kind of an interesting one along the way because we know by looking at our, the frequently asked questions uh, document that's been updated along the way as far as Chris at Ian's one, that it was, you know, it's very clear in there that the property that is purchased is owned by the, the title is owned, it's owned by the state of Maine. So We've, um, you know, basically been following the legislation and any any other uh, pertinent information regarding that. But it's evolving, so yay! <laughs> we were certainly hoping that it, it might. Um, I'll do a little synopsis. I won't read everything here. There's a couple of pages here. I have put that. Uh, we've got it on our website, and I've sent it out to folks in the past. So you should have it somewhere. And if you don't, by all means, give us a holler. But essentially, what's happening here is the big DOE, if you will, the federal folks, U.S. Department of Education, has sent out a couple of updates. So there was an, this one here is for May 4th, and it was a May 20th update in both 2022 about how do we, how do we, the disposition of Ian's property, how, do, how does that all happen? And um, the good news 
it's it's gone to a point where now there are some options that didn't exist exist before. So if we can sneak over to the next slide, I'll pick that right up. All right, thank you. Okay, so in general, once equipment, I'll read a little bit. Once equipment and supplies are no longer needed for purpose of the EANS program or the period of performance, so EANS September 30th, 2023, that includes that tidings amendment, and there's the citation. It says, however, rather than disposing of equipment or supplies purchased with EANS when no longer needed for purposes of the EANS program or the period of performance ends, an SEA, here comes the big part, an SEA may allow, so the SEA is us, the state, uh, may allow a non-public school to continue the use to use the equipment and supplies to the extent they are needed for other allowable purposes under the federal education program in which the non-public school participates. So there's a few examples as you read through there. So if you have, say your school is uh, connected to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, that is another federal program, uh, IDEA, so individual disabilities, you more than likely have some connection there and or others, other federal grants that you may have, or Title I, for instance, um, a lot of schools are connected to Title I, and that is a federal program. So you could retain this, um, these materials, or the or supplies, or you know, some type of an item that you needed, and that falls under those allowable uses, as far as the EANS CARISA program, you could hang on to those, and that's a good thing. Still owned by the state of Maine, but it would still fall under another program and allow you to hang on to it longer. Um, so looking down through a little bit more of when equipment is no longer needed for the EANS program or other activities currently supported by the department, and when that's the big department, the federal department of education, which is a non-public participates, the SEA must dispose of the equipment. So there's some rules for us at the state level of what we have to do. That last little paragraph, uh, by the way, I would, would recommend that you guys read through it all a couple of times. And if you do have questions, by all means, uh, touch base, but just the highlights. With respect to supplies that are no longer needed for the EANS program or another federal education program, if an SEA, so the state, if we have, has a residual inventory of unused supplies exceeding $5,000 in total aggregate value, the SEA must retain, must retain the supplies for use on other activities or sell them and in a case, in any case, they want their money back, the federal government that is. So if that's the case, but Essentially, the disposition allows some flexibility that wasn't there early on in the original, uh, essentially, requirements of the program, and we would always find it in the latest FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions uh, handout. That is, by the way, also on our website, and we have it in our resources here on this slide deck also. So that's some good news. So you'll have a chance to perhaps hang on to it a little longer if you choose to or need to, and we'll kind of move forward from there. And that discussion will be school by school uh, to see what your needs are and do, does what you would like to do, does that align with this disposition, but also the EANS One Carissa program overall. All right, yeah. back to me. So on this slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, well, the next two slides, we're gonna talk about staffing. Um, and so everybody should have received an email or at least Someone who is designated for a school should have received uh, a updated staffing uh, email, I believe, roughly about a month ago now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, actually it started on the uh, week of 718, so in July, so time flies. So we just updated it. So basically what ended up happening, uh, as you guys are familiar with, we originally had the Excel log that everybody was utilizing for uh, timesheets. We did create a PDF form fillable for consistency sake uh, to make sure that every timesheet was being processed the same way. Also uh, an instance of multiple pay rates. Uh, so if Rob Palmer is getting paid for uh, tutoring and he's getting paid at $15 an hour, what have you, uh, and then, but he's also a substitute teacher. And when he's subbing, let's say he makes $22 an hour. So if Rob Palmer is working for, you know, twice in one week for two different jobs at two different pay rates, you would process uh, a timesheet for two timesheets for that one week, both with Rob Palmer's name on it at one for each pay rate and the number of hours. Uh, and then the description you would list, you know, tutored students for, you know, math 
supplement work, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to forgive me. I am not originally from the education field. So if my terminology is off, I am going off the cuff with this. Um, so that's for processing the timesheets. We are trying to keep pretty strict uh, because we do, we process the timesheets and then we send them off to our vendor who you all are probably familiar with, uh, Edward Atlantic Staffing. He has to deal with me on a weekly basis. Um, so, and I'm always sending him things. So we do try to make sure that we do send things out in a timely manner as he has work on his end that he has to process. So we are processing them by 12 p.m. on Monday, every Monday, unless it is a holiday, in which case 12 p.m. Tuesday, uh, it, it will get done and will get sent out. So we aren't able to process any timesheets. Now to make sure that timesheets are not missed, if you have timesheets that were completed by your staff member after 12 p.m. on Monday, or if you can't get them to us by 12 p.m. on Monday, please make sure that you send them to us either that Friday or that next Monday so they get processed in that next go around. Because if not, there's a good chance that they are going to get lost. That shared email box that you send them into is exactly that. It is a shared email box. So uh, any communications with schools goes into that email box and it does fill up quickly. Uh, we do the best we can to make sure that we're not missing timesheets, but for the sake of, you know, reiteration on making sure that your staff members are getting paid for the work that they are doing, please resend that in the necessary uh, processing window for receiving uh, emails with, uh, with timesheets. Uh, and then if you have a new staff member, please make sure you are using the uh, authorized DOE staffing requests that were sent out. Um, we're hoping to follow up uh, with an email here soon. We're probably going to reiterate with PDF forms. We'll send those out again and we'll send out the staffing request, the Excel log. Uh, big things on the staffing logs, we need, <clears throat> we need to make sure that you are including the service fee, which for... Uh, teaching personnel, substitutes, uh, tutoring, what have you, is 1.139. And then for medical staff, you know, your counselors, your nurses, nursing assistants, what have you, those are billed at a different rate, which is 1.294. Give me when I'm pulling that off the cuff again. So, we need to make sure that those are put in there because that could be the difference between having uh, an employee that you're allocating $5,000 for or $8,000. And that does make a difference as far as your allocations that you have for your staff members. If you have everything booked out all the way out, as far as I have $10,000 allocated for X number of staff, they're all going to get this pay rate. They're all going to have this service fee. It will change your math if you're not using the correct service fee. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Kevin. We will answer that. That's, that's an easy one. You know, Rob Palmer is, you know, uh, a part-time nurse that we're bringing in to assist with, uh, you know, COVID for these reasons. We'll tell you right now, 1.294, without a doubt. So, or if you're questioning it, again, just feel free. We're, we're here to help. We want to make sure that everything runs smoothly and that everything looks correct because uh, what really ends up is we don't want to end up in an audit and no one knows the correct answer to a question. That just looks bad. So we're here to answer questions. We're here to help you guys figure things out. We're here to help process this along. So, and then also making sure that your staffing requests are up to date. So if Rob Palmer expired on uh, September 1st, you can't pay him. We cannot pay Rob Palmer for time that he worked past September 1st unless we get an up to date staffing request, which does take time to process because we process it. It goes to Atlantic Staffing and then it's processed on Atlantic Staffing. If it is an existing employee, it does go a lot faster. If it's a new employee, it does take time. So, you know, make sure that you're sending out staffing requests for new employees well in advance before. Uh, expecting them to be getting paid. Um, and it also does not hurt to reach out to us if you have several new staff members that you're not sure they're cleared to work, reach out to us. We're more than happy to reach out to Edward, get an answer for you, get back to you right away. Uh, I know some of you guys have been doing that and I 
I really appreciate you taking the time to shoot me an email and just asking. It's better to get confirmation than to assume that your employees are good to go. I'm a little long winded today, if you guys hadn't noticed. So, but I want to make sure that we're we're covering our bases with the information. Uh, Carissa Eanes for uh, reallocation. We are processing staffing requests the same way we are processing uh, for the original Carissa. So if you're, if you've expended all your original Carissa funds for staffing and you don't feel like moving any funds over and you want to use reallocation, if you have reallocation, submit a staffing request just like you would. Uh, just make sure that you notate that it is for reallocation. We'll set it up. It's good to go and we can process it just like it was originally. Same thing with timesheets. Um, if that staff member is set up to be on uh, reallocation rather than Carissa, we're not worried. As long as we have some way of tracking that that employee is through one of the funding sources and it's notated somewhere on their staffing request, not a problem. Just submit a, a staffing request for whichever funding source they're on and we'll get it processed just like we normally would. Same thing with the timesheets. We'll get them knocked out uh, and get your employees paid so that way they keep showing up to work. And uh, just a friendly reminder, if you do have staff members uh, and also for your invoicing, you do need to keep records. You should be keeping uh, a very neat and orderly record uh, for anything you've purchased, for all your staff members that you've had work and paid for through the EANS funds. Everything needs to be accounted because it's not just us who's going to get audited audited when US Ed has questions. They're going to come and ask you to look at your books. They're going to want to make sure that everything is, again, neat and orderly. The, the easier things are for an auditor to come in and look at and make sure that it matches up to what we have, the faster your audit should go. And, you know, if, again, if your books are in good shape and good order, um, your auditor should be in and out of there in no time. So. Uh, again, if you do have any questions, uh, this is our email down below in this last paragraph. We're here to answer questions. We're here to help you out with this process. We want to make sure that this uh, this goes as smooth as possible uh, and you guys can continue to do the good work. And on that, I'm going to finally catch a breath and I'm going to let Kevin handle the next one. All right. Thank you, Rob. So. You could call this section miscellaneous, but I got all fancy and with additional requirements. Uh, so in this one, you may have seen this one. I sent it out a while ago. You're just really trying to get some confirmation on the three grants, the Carissa Eanes one, Carissa Eanes one reallocated, and at the time, the ARP Eanes two, uh, the, the three different grants that exist under Eanes. And what we wanted to do is make sure that we hadn't overlooked anybody because uh, you have to be a certified school and so forth. So that's all part of the intent to apply on these grants. It has various questions as you check them off, it allows you to kind of move on or uh, some questions will, depending on your answer, like the PPP loans, if you receive the second loan, then you wouldn't be eligible for say uh, the, the rest of these, the Crystal One or ARP Eans. So that's part of why there was an intent to apply, which then led to the application. So if the first part was good, we went to the second. Now I've sent this email out and some of you have sent it. Uh, there's two places you can answer this. Uh, basically, you're just letting me know, you're sending us an email, and then we'll hang on to it in a file. And it's really, if you will, just a, it's a good way to do a, a record keeping, if you will, but also in the case of an audit or some other complication, we have the evidence and so forth. A quick way to say, all right, this particular school chose to participate here, and they chose not to on this other one. And, you know, that way we have that record. So if you haven't done that, please do send it. You can go into Jim and you can go on to the intent to apply for these. And on that sheet, it gives you an option right at the top to, to opt out, to just check the box that says no. That's fine too. And it'll show up on some of our uh, software where it will show up in red. And we know that that's essentially, that's the evidence there that that school is chose not to participate or if you chose to participate. So those two options, either one is fine. And like I said, we'll hang on to it, whether it's in the software through GEM or, of uh, one of the folders that we use here with SharePoint. So uh, please do that. That would be very helpful. A uh, few things on this one. You've got, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm scolding. I'm just going to say that there's auditing coming, <laughs> whether it's in us coming to visit or something online. 
uh, through Teams or Zoom, uh, whether it's a, the federal government asking questions and whatnot. But we're just really saying it's a good time to play nicely <laughs> because there's some requirements in there. And you look, if you go through your intent to apply your application, the uh, GAN report, the, which has those attachments connected to it, it basically lets you know that some of these things may happen. And the folks that are, can, that are essentially doing the audit, uh, they have a job to do and they have a right to do it. And we just want to make sure that we, you, we're, we're all ready and we're certainly hospitable for these folks coming in. So that's really what that's all about. Um, as far as like ARP EANS 2, there's a whole section where we at, at the EANS folks at the DOE, we will be the ones that are working with procurement folks in actually getting these items for you and so forth. Uh, so just on that, we would sort of kind of remind folks that, you know, there are some some ethical things that we have to consider. So that's that's it in a nutshell on that one. I'm not going to read it, but, but I, I do recommend that you do. Right. I uh, hope I didn't cut you off there, Kevin. You so don't mind. Wrap up, so. Uh, so we're at the Q&A phase. So if you have any questions, uh, we are here to answer your questions and uh, hopefully provide you with some good guidance. If not, it's Kevin's fault whether it came out of my mouth or not. <laughs> All right. I did look in the chat. I don't I don't see any on the chat, so that's fine. But if you do have something in mind, you can unmute yourself or we can help you with that and you can ask questions. Uh, like I said, we still are available at our regular email addresses and phone numbers and so forth. So don't feel like, uh, I, I think I repeat this each time, but if you get to a place that you're working through and it's a struggle, you know, email, call us, we'll help out. And uh, so that would be, uh, oh, oh, look, we had a we had a kind comment. Thank, thank you, Amy. <laughs> Just want to point that out. <laughs> Excellent. So Again, the slide deck will be on the website shortly. And then the, the video part, if you will, is that the right word to use? I still use video. <laughs> that will also be on the site available here in the near future. Uh, Karen is our other coworker here and she, she helps us out with that and it works out really well. And like I said, on every email that I have going out, and I'm not sure if it's in yours or not, Rob, but it does have our link to the DOE website for EANS. And that's really helpful for all of this stuff. It will be right there listed. I went on this morning just to double check that everything was working and it, it was no issues at all. And uh, so there's some good information there if you would you know, have anything that uh, you need a ref little refresher course. And again, when you're all said and done, don't suffer. Call, email, we'll help you out. So any others in the chat? That's that's it. All right. So we will um, we'll hover around here for a few moments, and uh, if we don't see anything new, then we will we'll end this and again get it up on the website. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>